You know the rule. You're allowed to take as long as you want, so long as the subject is Duke Nukem forever. Before we get started, I wanted to go through some oversights from the last episode. In one of the game's art books, there's an image with the caption, Early Concept of Negaduke Before He Was Rendered Out. Right next to it, this screenshot. As such, I suggested that this was a later model of Negaduke. However, it seems more likely that this was unfortunate placement, and it's just Duke Nukem himself. Also, I mentioned the voice from this trailer scene as possibly being the PA system. Jiggy Kramer informed me in a comment that it's probably an EDF soldier taunting a pig cop, saying, One thing I've done throughout this series is refer to the Duke Nukem Forever team as 3D Realms. When bringing this up with Scott Miller, he suggested referring to them as Apogee instead. As he put it, 3D Realms was just a brand name we used back then, no different than using the brand name Duke Nukem. The company was, and is still, Apogee. Alright, let's get on with the video. Starting with the timeline of 2007. It's late January. George Broussard posts higher ads on Gamma Sutra with this very small picture of Duke. So tiny. He says, this is an in-game screen of Duke standing in a random hallway. This initiative brings in new faces at Apogee. One of them is Lane Johnson, who creates a new look for the Cycloid Emperor. This set the foundation for the remaining alien cast, which would continue to be worked on up until 2009. Raphael von Lierop was their new creative director. He saw the completed content from the game, and was actually surprised at how much was finished. Lierop would approach Broussard regarding a push to release the game and blow everyone out of the water. However, Broussard felt it was still at least two years away from completion. On March 20th, Scott Miller went public about the game's many delays. Quote, We set the bar too high, and tried too hard to make the game to beat all games. In the last 18 months, we've taken a much more realistic look at the project. We've hired a truckload of experienced help, and I personally believe we are now on the right track. Obviously, no game is worth any sort of weight like this, but the game's going to make people happy for sure. On June 6th, Scott Miller responded to a question regarding the game's financial status. Quote, We've been a key factor in several other major releases, including Max Payne, several third-party Duke titles on consoles, and Prey. These have all greatly solidified Apogee's financial stability. In fact, I recently accounted for the retail sales of all franchises and brands that Apogee had a hand in starting. It amounted to over $1 billion. With Duke Nukem Forever, we can afford to take our time. That, in and of itself, may be part of the problem, though. In the same month, an issue of Game Informer gave us an early look at the Energy Leech boss fight, and a higher res scene of what was previously shown in the Gamma Sutra post. I can't think of a better time to mention the following. Earlier in development, Duke was meant to ride around in a miniature Barbie car. As of 2007, the idea was changed. Now Duke will ride an RC car instead. A similar concept would re-emerge with the Wholesome Mobile in the eventual DLC, The Doctor Who Cloned Me. Now it's October. Apogee licenses Take-Two Interactive to publish a new, console-based Duke Nukem game. This was called Duke Nukem Begins, a third-person cooperative shooter originally pitched to Edge of Reality but then picked up by Gearbox, which was a much smaller company at the time. The idea for this game came from the mind of Scott Miller, who wanted Duke to have an origin story. This resulted with an advance from Take-Two to Apogee, which was somewhere in the ballpark of 2.5 million. Then, a promotional image for Duke Nukem Forever was released, showing Duke cracking his wrists. This turned out to be a teaser for a video teaser that would show up shortly after. On December 19th, the famous teaser drops. You're probably familiar with this one. It was discussed all over the place at the time. In retrospect, there isn't much to say about it. Many believed it was made to confirm that the game was still being worked on. In it, Duke curls, and a few scripted enemy sequences play in between. The Assault Trooper looks a bit different, although otherwise, the art direction remained consistent from this point onwards. Note that this scene appears to take place in the LA streets at night, which we never see in the final game. In 2008, the game was nearing completion. However, Apogee was finally running into financial troubles. More than 20 million had been spent on this project alone thus far. Nonetheless, the team continues to push for a release. In late January, Tremel Isaac mentions that the team is working on polishing set pieces, environments, and characters. Scott Miller was pushing hard to bring in an external producer for help. 
In February, they recruited Brian Hook. Hook would then become a project leader, directly below George Broussard. According to Scott Miller, he helped tremendously. Brian Hook has described the state of the project upon joining as fractured and demoralized. It lacked direction, milestones, or cohesion. According to the famous Wired.com article, How Success Killed Duke Nukem, Hook did what nobody else would, and stood up to Broussard's constant request for tweaking and changing the game. This made it possible for the team to move forward without getting stalled by new requests. In June, a new episode of the online video game series, The Jace Hall Show, was released. It featured an interview with Apogee, and gameplay of Duke Nukem Forever recorded on camera, which was actually shot prior in 2007. You might wonder how this came to be, considering how secretive this project was. Well, I asked Scott Miller, and he told me it happened because they love the guy. Simple as that. One famous quote during the interview was, What the f*** is taking so long? This marks the first time that raw footage of Duke Nukem Forever was ever seen by the public. In this footage, the game appears visually similar to its final counterpart, however there are differences. Interestingly, the main menu seems to be largely unchanged since 2001. Duke's still using the Mark Skelton model, noticeable by the design of his gloves. Here we get a brief look at the Energy Leech boss fight before it was changed to take place underwater. One remarkable difference is having the full game's arsenal on hand at once. Those familiar with the final game would know that on release, players were limited to two weapons at a time. Despite the game's huge progress in recent years, Duke Nukem Forever did not show up at E3 in 2008. However, Duke Nukem still had a presence there in the form of a four-minute teaser for the upcoming Duke Nukem Trilogy. This wasn't the existing trilogy of Duke games, but rather a new trilogy in development for the PlayStation Portable and Nintendo DS. The teaser itself honestly feels like a parody, it plays like something you might see in an old AVGN skit. The trilogy was a joint effort with Deep Silver. Little was heard about these games until Critical Mass was eventually released by Frontline Studios in 2011 for the Nintendo DS. The PlayStation Portable version was never finished, and the other two games were cancelled. I asked Scott Miller about these games. To quote him, the first one kinda sucked, so the rest got cancelled by the publisher. Miller expanded on this, pointing out that he had no input with the trilogy. Its whole existence had to do with a license agreement with gaming veteran Terry Nagy. On August 25th, George Broussard said that Duke Nukem Forever now has several hours of fairly polished gameplay. He then exclaims that he's never been as happy or excited about the game as he is now. Cool. On September 24th, an Xbox Live Arcade version of Duke Nukem 3D was released. It contains a one-to-one -one identical copy of the Duke 3D Atomic GRP. This port was considered an exercise for the team to get adjusted to Xbox development. If you were to unlock all of its achievements, you'd get two exclusive screenshots of Duke Nukem Forever. One of Duke at a strip club, and an in-game screenshot focused on an Octobrain enemy. On November 7th, George Broussard posted an image of someone in their office performing motion capture for the game. A month later, on December 18th, Apogee released this wallpaper for Duke Nukem Forever. Hey, I had this wallpaper for years! How nostalgic! 2009. Ooh, this year's a big one. On January 6th, George Broussard went to visit Take Two in New York with a copy of the game. Take-Two was reportedly impressed with the gameplay, and pleased with the state of development. They wanted Apogee to focus on Xbox 360 and PS3 versions. Negotiations continued, including talk of a multiplayer mode, and a demand to complete the game within 12 months. But Apogee were already struggling. George Broussard and Brian Hook asked for $6 million, suggesting that they wouldn't be able to financially afford the changes without coming to an agreement. They might also be forced to release the team working on the game due to their financial situation. While several online sources will tell you that the $6 million deal was initially accepted, according to Scott Miller, this never happened. Then came the infamous tweet by Broussard on January 12th, saying, Game developers often say cutting is shipping. This year, we begin with a vengeance and a chainsaw. Post-mortem, a level designer for Duke Nukem Forever named Andrew Baker suggested that the original levels prior to cuts ran on consoles like a fat guy up Everest. 
Thus, a lot of the game which struggled to run at a passable frame rate ended up being scrapped. Some levels ended up being cut into four parts. And even with that change, as many of you have experienced, the game's loading times are not very good. According to Baker, dead ends, side routes, any excess gameplay that could be cut was cut. Now, remember Duke Begins? It ends up getting suspended in April. Many sources cited this as a decision of Take Two's. However, upon asking Scott Miller, his recollection is that the suspension was from the developers at Gearbox. It was, after all, a much smaller company at the time. He recalls they didn't have the dev power to pull it off. Nonetheless, Apogee was relying on the return from this game to assist with their financial struggles, so the suspension was a big hit to the company. Do consider that Take-Two may have had more involvement here. Unfortunately, money was running out. It started to become clearer with every passing day that Apogee wouldn't be able to finish the game without an advance from Take-Two. Now here's where things get messy, as if they weren't already. Take-Two proposes to Apogee that they purchase and acquire the Duke Nukem franchise from them. Apogee saw this as an unacceptable idea for the lack of upfront money, no guaranteed minimum payment, and no guarantee to complete Duke Nukem forever. So of course, they declined the offer. This situation holds more significance later on. Apogee at this point considered it impossible to continue their developments without funding. So, on May 6th, they announced a layoff. This results in the loss of Duke Nukem Forever's development team. They told their employees to collect their stuff and put it in boxes. Is this game over? Is Duke Nukem Forever finally dead? In a June interview, Tramiel Isaac said that, as crappy as this was, Apogee were still class acts about it. They let everyone work on their portfolios, helped tons of us find jobs, and invited big-name companies in to headhunt from the Apogee employees. They did everything they could to minimize the impact the loss of a job would bring. A later quote by Gearbox's Steve Gibson reads, There was some real hope that this game was going to ship in the next year. On or close to the day of, George Broussard spoke to one of his friends about the layoff. He said, This is the worst day of my life. Randy. And so it begins. Randy Pitchford, at the time CEO of Gearbox, said, George Broussard is not a poor man, but I would estimate that he lost 20 to 30 million dollars of his own money on Duke Nukem Forever. I don't care who you are, that's a hell of a lot of money. He was committed to Duke to the point of insanity. He'd rather have the game burn than have a bad version of it come out. Following the staff layoff, multiple leaks occurred showing off screenshots, concept art, models, and more. The most noteworthy of which comes from the portfolios of Brian Brewer and Jay Brushwood. The game looks very similar at this point to its final release. Safe to say that most of the graphical work had been finished. Included in the leaks was the entire plot. The game's events were considerably different. At one point, the Octa King served as the game's final boss. No second Cycloid Emperor fight. The character Bombshell, who doesn't exist in the final game, was still largely involved. Here's a render of Bombshell that demonstrates what the character most likely looked like at this point in development. I previously showed this off to compare with old concept art, mentioning that the model's creation is undated. It is, though it was probably being used in-game around this time in development. You can still access the plot document, which was created in 2007, and last edited on July 29th, 2008. I'll leave a link to it in the description. A week after the layoff, publisher Take-Two Interactive, who at this point reportedly invested a total of 12 million into the game, filed a 30-page lawsuit in New York regarding a contractual breach. This was related to the continual delays and failure to finish Duke Nukem Forever. A preliminary injunction is requested to keep all assets at Apogee intact. They demanded that Apogee pay back the 400,000 advanced from the GT Interactive days, and the 2.5 million that they fronted in 2007. Take-Two alleges that Apogee had sufficient funds to cover their outstanding obligations in an offshore account. So while this situation wasn't meant to make everyone go completely bankrupt, it would probably mark the end of Apogee. Furthermore, Take-Two seeks to obtain the source and object code to independently develop the game for consoles. This was never a part of any legal agreement, so George Broussard is firm and refuses to hand it over. After some pondering, Broussard began to consider the possibility that Take-Two was deliberately damaging their financial situation as a bully tactic in order to acquire the Duke Nukem franchise in a fire sale. In response to this, Apogee created a countersuit 
claiming a breach of their October 2007 agreement on the game Duke Nukem Begins, reflecting damages far in excess of $75,000, including damages done to the Duke Nukem franchise rights. We will vigorously defend ourselves against this publisher, retorts Broussard. In response to all this, Scott Miller said publicly that these filed lawsuits are entirely one-sided statements, based on knee-deep BS and with more spin than a top. So, legal stuff aside, is this the end for Duke Nukem Forever? Here's what happened next. Nine ex-employees, including Alan Blum and David Regal, asked Scott Miller if they could try and finish the game on their own. Scott had no objections with this. He thought that if they could make good progress on their own, then perhaps in the future the game could be resurrected with Take Two. Thus, development continued throughout 2009 in David Regal's house. Together, they formed Triptych Games, which would focus on finishing the single-player component of the game on PC. Unfortunately, this initiative would change a lot of the game. The character Bombshell, the EDF base, and Area 51 locations are rumored to have been removed at this time. David Regal has since informed us of the state of the game in 2009. It was supposedly about 80% complete. However, work on the game's story and characters had barely begun. NPC behavior didn't really exist, and none of the music had yet been made. There was a planned ending, but it quote, wasn't really there. Towards the end of the year, Apogee had a new idea. This was to approach a company they had a close relationship with, and ask if they would be interested in helping Triptych Games to complete the near-finished PC game and port it to consoles. This company was sold the Duke Nukem franchise. And that company was Gearbox. Randy Pitchford managed to convince the president of 2K Games that Gearbox could complete development of Duke Nukem Forever and its ports in serviceable time. From this point on, Apogee is no longer involved with Duke Nukem Forever. You are not required not get involved. That's an order. I've got a bad feeling about this. In November, Triptych releases a new trailer for the game. There's a lot of intrigue from the community, who genuinely figured the game was dead. This trailer directly inspires another trailer, to be released by Gearbox in 2011. In January 2010, a deal was in the making. Triptych Games moves into the offices of Gearbox Software. Then, Gearbox brings in Piranha Games to port Duke to consoles and handle the game's multiplayer component, which from experience I can tell you is actually quite good. This was a huge next step for the game. David Regal of Triptych says that the team were struggling to find time to work on various important aspects of the game. Only when Gearbox stepped in were they able to tackle the neglected work. On February 2nd, an asset purchase agreement between Apogee and Gearbox Software is finalized. But what about that lawsuit from Take-Two? Well, it was settled with prejudice and details undisclosed in May. Neither Apogee or Take-Two are ever allowed to bring this to court again. Information on how exactly this was settled is scarce. I asked Scott Miller, who told me that was one of the big wins for doing the deal with Gearbox. They settled the lawsuit with Take-Two at no cost. Randy Pitchford says the respect that Gearbox built with Take-Two by working on Borderlands gave him the assurance that he could bring all the pieces together and save Duke. But why did he do it? Well, Pitchford had a strong relationship with Apogee. After all, he worked there initially, and even helped to ship the original Duke Nukem 3D. He's even said before that he owes Duke Nukem his career. Now that all the legal trouble is over, all that's left to do is finish and publish the game. On August 11th, Kotaku posted an article about a rumor that Gearbox had taken up the development of Duke Nukem Forever. On September 2nd, George Broussard posted an image of flying pigs on Twitter, and this caused a great deal of speculation among those still following the game. Especially once John St. John, voice actor of Duke Nukem, changed his avatar on Twitter to Duke Nukem. On September 3rd, Duke Nukem Forever unexpectedly showed up at the 2K booth before the press even got a hold of it. This was done as an initiative of respect for those fans who'd been waiting so long to play the game. But even they still had to wait! The lineup to play had people waiting up to four hours. Promotional material at the time would prove that the old Duke Nukem model by Mark Skelton had been replaced, which was a controversial change even at the time. Duke Nukem Forever was then, of course, officially re-announced by Gearbox. The game would finish development in their studio, releasing simultaneously on PC, Xbox 360, 
and PlayStation 3. The expectation was for the game to be released the following year. Scott Miller chimed in to say this about their decision. Gearbox was hand-picked as the new home for Duke Nukem because of their continued passion, commitment, and longtime heritage with the brand and Apogee. Then, George Broussard said, Their vision for the future of Duke is exciting and unbelievable. I personally cannot wait for fans to see their unique take on the franchise. This will be a win-win situation for everyone involved, especially the fans. Gearbox's Steve Gibson had this to say, We were the only middle party that happened to have a trusting relationship with Apogee, and the resources available to hold both sides. Gibson also discussed the state of the game after the initial work by Gearbox. According to him, at this time the game was playable from front to back. It simply needed some polish. Then, it would be ready for shipping. How much of the game was completed before Gearbox software took over? What do you think? Oh, I think if you're talking like in terms of the vision of the game, this is the vision that the Three Realms is vision. We are... That's not what she asked, Steve. It's very complicated. Yeah. <laughs> A journalist at Shack News managed to play the game's preview. They noted down several key points of discussion. The playable demo included the game's intro, up to the introduction of the Wholesome Twins. These two are a parody of the real-life Olsen Twins. I wonder how they felt about this portrayal. <laughs> Alright, time for my reward. Twincest! In case you're wondering, these two had existed for quite a long time in the game at this point, but how long exactly is uncertain. All I can tell you is that they are present in the 2008 story leak, which was long before Gearbox involvement. Also playable in the demo was a segment from the Morningwood level, which included the monster truck. It appeared to be rather limited in enemy encounters, with an average of two to a maximum of four enemies being fought at a time. A sprint button is confirmed, and the player's arsenal has been restricted to two weapons. You can only hold two weapons at once, and I gotta say, that pisses me off. I am not going to lie, I do not like that. I don't like that in any game. While being uninvolved in the decision of limiting the arsenal, and understanding the concerns that many had, Steve Gibson partially defends it by saying the reality of today's audience is much different than it was when Duke Nukem 3D came out. I reached out to Scott Miller about the weapon limit, who says he hated the idea from its very conception. So who was actually responsible for this change? Stay tuned to find out. In August, Gearbox announced their Borderlands Game of the Year edition. Included was a code for Duke Nukem Forever's first access club. The code would allow you to play the game's demo a week before release. Then came the Holiday 2010 issue of PC Gamer Magazine, where an uncredited journalist visits the 2K Games headquarters to give an advanced preview of the game. However, for whatever reason, despite the same demo being available to play at PAX earlier that year, they weren't allowed to take any screenshots for their article. So what did PC Gamer do? They brought with them a professional courtroom sketch artist, Suzanne Forbes, to capture scenes while they were being played. I can't believe that really happened, but here it is. Incredible. To close off the year, in December, Gearbox released two new screenshots from the game's demo to further promote the game. 2011. Finally, the release year. In case anyone's wondering, the game was still, in fact, using a heavily modified version of Unreal Engine 1. It does use some Unreal Engine 2 stuff like static meshes. Duke Nukem Forever was actively being worked on by close to 100 people at this time, according to Randy Pitchford in the art book. On January 21st, Gearbox released Forever's debut trailer. It features gameplay, with Invaders Must Die by The Prodigy playing in the background. The release date is set for May 3rd. On February 7th, a final package of screenshots were released for the game. There's no point in comparisons now since it's, after all, the final game. Which you've probably played by now anyways. Or avoided like the plague. Come March 24th, the game is delayed once more for last minute finishing touches and polish. Duke Nukem Forever's new release date is June 14th. Although many are understandably skeptical, given the history. This is bull****. This is bull****. Promotional materials begin to hit local stores particularly GameStops. There's me in 2011, eagerly awaiting disappointment. In April, Gearbox released a bunch of mini-teasers for the game, asking the viewer what would Duke do in various situations. Please remember to wash hands after playing. Ew. On May 24th, Apogee posted for the very last time on the 3D Realms Duke Nukem Forever page. It's a celebration for the game going gold. 
Then there came the launch trailer, which was released on June 1st. On June 3rd, Duke's first access club unlocked. Fans got to play the game at home for the first time. Reception is mixed, but there's still a sense of optimism for the final release. A launch party was held by Gearbox on June 11th called Duke Nukem Presents Happy Ending. All I'm able to find of it today is this one interview with Randy Pitchford, where he says approximately 2,000 people attended, more than they were expecting. Three days later, on June 14th, 2011, Duke Nukem Forever was finally shipped. In total, development took 14 years and 43 days. Randy Pitchford said, Everyone that's ever been through these doors has left some of themselves in the game. It's in there, and no one can ever take that away from those people. Wow, he really expected a completely different outcome from this game. What I find interesting is that Pitchford, throughout all stages of Gearbox development, implies that Forever was the work of Apogee. Gearbox just polished it and sent it out there. I don't think he's lying, as far as he's aware. The processes involved to get the game shipped in time probably changed a lot of things which Apogee wouldn't have approved. So how did it turn out in the end? Well, to start this discussion, I think it's smart to address George Broussard's opinion of it. He refers to 2011's Duke Nukem Forever as... a joke. Quote, it wasn't supposed to be like that. Ah, uh, no, what am I doing? What kind of sick motherfucker picks up wet feces? What the hell? No, come on, no! The overall experience established a perverted view of the franchise. Remember, Duke was first and foremost a macho action hero. But in the released game, he's kind of a douche. Duke, what's happening to us? Looks like you're fucked. <laughs> I'm not the first to call it like that. The community has since referred to 2011's Duke as Douche Nukem. Very fitting. A month after the game's release, Duke Nukem Forever sold 376,300 units in the US, which put it in second place behind LA Noir. Take Two has admitted the game didn't meet their sales expectations, although it did manage to turn a profit in the end. So what went wrong here? Well, Douche Nukem was one thing, but the real problem was the game itself. It was kind of pathetic. Do you remember Tom Chick, the journalist who came into the offices of Apogee in 2006 to check out the game? He ended up giving Duke Nukem Forever a brutal review. This negative attention no doubt hurt the game's sales, but there was plenty more of it to come. For years, in fact. Duke Nukem Forever is often brought up in worst video game lists, although many believe this is because of its infamy. There are no doubt far worse games. There are worse Duke Nukem games. Most often criticized is the obnoxious tone, linear level design, and dated graphics. Although that last one I feel should be forgiven considering the context. The gunplay isn't great, although that shotgun was admittedly pretty good. My biggest gripe with the game is how long it takes to get to the actual shooting. It's at the end of the game's fifth chapter where you finally stop goofing off. That's about an hour if you know what you're doing. One complaint, which was pretty much universal, was the two-weapon limit. Initially, many pointed fingers at Gearbox for this. However, Broussard took to the forums to redirect this negative attention to himself instead. Yeah, blame us for it if you want. I don't know what will happen with it in the future, but it was us. I stand by it too. I don't personally think it's good to carry 10 guns anymore. Consoles represent 70% of game sales today. Considering that, there are only so many buttons on a controller. And the two-weapon limit has been standard since Halo in 2001. It's actually good gameplay to decide what to carry at any given time. Choices and consequences are good things in a game. These are all the words of Broussard, by the way. I am not going to be responsible for a hot take like this. In regards to the game's juvenile humor... Press the button, sure enough, Duke reaches down. He's got a turd in his hand. <laughs> you'd hear nobody from Apogee talking about the game this way. In fact, it's a stark contrast in comparison with earlier interviews like those in the Jace Hall show, where Broussard and Miller emphasized the intent to create fun, mature shooting games. What sort of video game products have you guys put out? I think we're known most for games your mother wouldn't want you to play. That's things like Max Payne or Prey or Duke Nukem 3D. Just really violent, uh, aggressive games. <laughs> what a mess. When we started making games, we were already 30 plus year old 
game developers. We wanted mature games for ourselves. So we were making the kind of games that we wanted to see ourselves. We always catered to the adult gamer, because that's what we are. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum. And I'm all out of gum. Gearbox had a ship the unshippable game attitude. Of course they wanted the game to be fun, but their priority wasn't necessarily there. And I don't say any of this to insult or belittle the work done at Gearbox, not even Randy Pitchford. Technically speaking, we might have never even got this game if it weren't for them. Although, I can't help but wonder if that reality enabled a more carefree attitude towards the thing. Some good news is that they updated the game on Steam two months after release. It included several quality of life improvements, such as being able to carry four weapons instead of just two. There was some consideration to bring this update to consoles, but unfortunately, this never happened. For the best experience, you'll have to stick with the PC game. Isn't that fitting, considering the strict PC focus for most of its development? Duke Nukem Forever received some extra attention later that year when the DLC came out. The Doctor Who Cloned Me by Triptych Games. This was built up of several ideas which were scrapped in development. Many consider the DLC to be an improvement, compared to what makes up the base game. After the DLC, Triptych would end up making two additional DLC packs, but these were for Borderlands 2. Then, they attempted to kickstart a cooperative beat-em-up called Fuzzy Slaughter. Unfortunately, it collected just 4,000 of its required 50,000 in funding. They made one final post on the failing date, implying that they would continue development. But this was the last we'd hear of the game. Triptych was eventually, silently, merged together with Gearbox. So who owns the Duke Nukem IP now? According to the USPTO, Gearbox Enterprises. It was renewed as recent as October 27th, 2021. At which point, Duke Nukem Forever still held the Guinness World Record for longest development of a video game. This was exceeded on October 3rd, 2022 by Ubisoft's Beyond Good and Evil 2. Duke Nukem Forever was no doubt a strange project, with many twists and unexpected turns. In 14 years, it went from being a passionate independent project to a professional studio project. But professionalism was never synonymous with Duke Nukem. No fans that I know ever cared about that. As an old PC Gamer magazine once said about Duke Nukem 3D, Duke Nukem's clever weapons, comic book colors, wry sense of humor, and sheer sense of fun more than makes up for a slightly dated engine. If you were to ask me personally, I think we were robbed of a franchise that could have been handled much differently going forward had everything gone as planned. The question is, which plan would that have been? What about the game, Duke? Was it any good? Yeah, but after 12 fucking years, it should be.